appreciate you all supporting the, the great work they do here at Prince William County uh, to, to tell the stories of the history here uh, in Northern Virginia. Um, as Dan mentioned, yeah, I work for, for the National Park Service. Uh, I've been working with them now for about 12 years, um, but I started off down at uh, Fort Sumter and Fort Moultrie in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, and that's really where I became acquainted with the, the character we're going to be uh, uh, checking out today. Uh, and his name is Edmund Ruffin. Um, has anybody ever heard of Edmund Ruffin before? Show of hands, just to get an idea. All right, about half of you have heard of him. So a lot of people have heard of him, uh, and you know, I grew up, you know, reading Civil War books, and his picture appears almost in many Civil War books. And I, you look at a picture of a guy like that, and you think he's got to have an interesting story, uh, and he really did. He had a, a fascinating story, and usually he's kind of uh, glossed over really quickly as being the man who fired the first shot of the Civil War. Um, and uh, I'm going to get into a little more detail about that. Some people say. It's a myth, uh, but and I'll get into to what he actually did. But when I was working down in South Carolina, I kind of you know started delving deep into this man. Um, and the more you find out, it's, it's amazing. Um, there is a uh, uh, he he wrote a diary. Uh, he kept a diary, um, and his diary was later transcribed and published. And uh, this is one volume of three volumes uh, that go into basically his daily life from the 1850s all the way up until 1865. So he really is a, a fascinating figure. And uh, he has a tie here to Prince William County. Uh, he comes and visits the county here a couple times uh, during, in 1861. And so uh, as I go through the talk, I'm going to focus on uh, what he encountered here in Prince William County when he visited. Um, but. Uh, do we have any uh, descendants of Edmund Ruffin here? Any descendants? It's very interesting. Oh, we, there we go. <laughs> kind of. What else do? <laughs> I think I got the youngest uh, visitor to our uh, symposium here this year. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, no, Edmund Ruffin, I got to tell you, working down at Fort Sumter, uh, where the first shots of the Civil War were fired, on numerous occasions, I'd say half a dozen times, uh, somebody in the one year I worked there, people would come up to me and say they were descended from Edmund Ruffin. Um, and so he has a, a quite a, a large following of uh, people who do their genealogy and find out about him. Uh, and uh, here you can see um, uh, me down. He's, he's from uh, Prince George County uh, in Virginia. So down south of the James, uh, you can see this is a marker of me standing there next to his birthplace uh, that's marked. Uh, and as we go to the talk, there's, there's numerous sites that are marked or interpreted for uh, Edmund Ruffin. Uh, and you can see here, he's listed as a southerner and the father of agricultural chemistry in America, uh, which is really what he's going to be known for before he becomes known as the man who fired the first shot of the Civil War. Um, so this is, uh, just to give you a sense of Edmund Ruffin, uh, Edmund Ruffin's born in 1794 uh, at Evergreen Plantation. He's a seventh generation Virginian. So he's about as Virginia as you get at that point. Uh, but you know, for most of his, it was like Edmund Ruffin uh, had one child, one son, Edmund Ruffin the next, and then all the way down to, I think Edmund Ruffin's the third Edmund Ruffin. Um, and, he's, and he had numerous, by the time he was born and he started becoming uh, an adult, he had numerous plantations. So this is a, 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 just to give you an idea of his world. Uh, so here's Richmond. Uh, you can see down here, this is where he's going to spend uh, a lot of his time. Uh, this is uh, uh, Coggins Point, and this is Beechwood. Uh, this is going to be his main plantation for the early part of his life. Uh, later, he moves up here to Hanover County to Marlborn, and that becomes his main seat. Uh, and then at the end of his life, he moves out to Amelia County out here to a plantation called Redmore. Uh, but that's kind of Edmund Ruffin's world uh, in, the, in the early 19th century. Uh, Ruffin attends school at College of William Mary, go tribe. 
uh, and uh, uh, he only is there for a couple of years, uh, and then he drops out. He actually uh, meets his wife there, Susan Travis. They get married in 1813, uh, and Ruffin is going to actually have a, a pretty large family. Uh, this is just a few of his children. Uh, they're going to have 11 children, nine that survive into adulthood, three boys, and six girls. Um, now, Ruffin, like I said, he's known as the, the father of agricultural chemistry. What's going on in, in, in Virginia, really throughout the whole state in the 19th century, is tobacco was, had sucked all the nutrients out of the soil. Um, and uh, they were having a real problem being productive on many of the farms. Uh, Ruffin uh, comes up with this idea. Uh, he, uh, this is his home there at Beechwood. Uh, just so you can see a picture. Today, this is actually all, all, it still exists kind of, but it's all kind of overgrown down there south of the James. Uh, but he discovers this item. This is called marl, uh, and it's a uh, fossilized seashells that basically exist uh, a, a few feet under the ground down there in southeast Virginia. And uh, what Ruffin does is he tests the acidity of the soil, and he sees that the, uh, the acidity is extremely high, and that's what's also leading to these farms being depleted. So what he discovers is this, that if you, you dig this up, uh, you crush it up, and you use it as fertilizer in the fields, uh, it rejuvenates the soil, and there's going to be much better production. Uh, so Ruffin is, you know, start, starts di ha having, and, and he was a large slave owner at that time too. Uh, he starts having his slaves dig up the marl, and they start depositing it in all the, the fields out there. Uh, and they're finding, and everybody's calling it Ruffin's folly. They think that it's, uh, you know, it's not going to actually work, uh, but it works extremely well. Um, and uh, Ruffin then is going to go around and start selling the gospel of marl that this is the way to rejuvenate Virginia soil and uh, continue to, to become a, uh, productive. And he's going to write this book uh, called An Essay on Calcareous Manures. Uh, and that, this is his, his, his main book that kind of puts him on the scene. Uh, you can see it's published in 1832. Uh, he publishes this, and now he's going around uh, trying to tell people all about this uh, idea of calcareous manures. Um, and so, so he's, he's a farmer, but he's also a scientist, and he's trying to find ways to make Virginia more productive. Uh, but Ruffin's an interesting character because he's, uh, you know, reading through his diaries and his numerous letters and his, his, the research he wrote, he's a very opinionated person. Uh, and oftentimes would go into conflict with other people uh, uh, on all sorts of issues. Uh, so I mentioned that, yes, he had, he, he had a, a large slave labor working for him. Uh, and he's going to be very pro-slavery. Uh, he thinks that slavery is efficient. He thinks that it's going to be able to be productive for doing the massive amount of work of digging out this marl and being able to deposit the soils. Um, but then it's interesting, because in 1831, right about the time this happens, Nat Turner's Rebellion breaks out. Uh, when Nat Turner's Rebellion breaks out, you have a large slave uprising. Many of the whites in Southeast Virginia are killed, and then there's an immediate pushback on all the other uh, slaves in the area, where the, uh, many of them are going to be executed. We had no connection with the actual rebellion. Uh, and Ruffin actually sticks his neck out to defend uh, one particular slave who he knew had no connection with Nat Turner's rebellion that a group wanted to execute. Um, but it just kind of shows you that Ruffin, even though he's you know coming up with these like. Uh, interesting schemes to try and rejuvenate Virginia's soil. Uh, he's kind of an outsider with many of the other people in his class. Um, and so you already get this kind of tension between Ruffin and many of the other Virginians in the area at that time. Um, but uh, so he publishes this, and then he's going to really get into getting Virginians to be more interested in their agriculture. Uh, and then he starts uh, this. It's called the, uh, the Farmer's Register. Uh, which is basically like a subscription magazine that they would get people to, to send in different things about their agriculture so they could learn about it and they could, uh, uh, he could try and send this, this message of moral and the importance of it to different people. That's also where Ruffin gets the, the name for his plantation later. He calls it Moral Burn. It's after this moral uh, that he discovered. Um, 
Now, this is an interesting story. So Ruffin's parents died when he was pretty young. Uh, and this was the plantation. This is all the ruins that were left in the early 20th century of a plantation called Tar Bay uh, down there in southeast Virginia. Uh, and a man by the name of Thomas Cock uh, was the one who was kind of Ruffin's uh, guardian. Uh, and Thomas Cock uh, uh, kind of took Ruffin under his wing. He helped him with all the moral experiments uh, and was kind of a good sounding off board for Edmund Ruffin. And the two of them were very, very close. Uh, well, one day in uh, the 1840, 1840 uh, February 22nd actually, uh, Ruffin goes and, and sees Thomas Cock uh, actually a day or two before and, and they talk. And Thomas Cock is talking about how, you know, he's, he's very depressed uh, about his life. And he leaves. Ruffin doesn't say anything. He leaves. On February 22nd, uh, Thomas Cock goes missing. Uh, nobody could find him. Uh, and then uh, they, they found a note that he had left in his room. Uh, and then one of the slaves goes out and is walking through the fields and comes upon a headless corpse out in the fields. Uh, when they come and find his body, uh, they find that uh, uh, you know, he had basically cut a hole in his sock. Uh, there was a musket with him. He had sat himself up against a tree stump, uh, used his toe, put a musket in his mouth, and used his toe to fire a shot into his head. And he committed suicide out there on the plantation. Uh, and this really haunted Edmund Ruffin. Uh, he couldn't believe, he came out and saw the scene and it, and it haunted him. Uh, he wrote that, you know, he, he's going to write like a 12 page essay about Thomas Cock and about his suicide. And he said, uh, but neither in real life nor in fiction, not even in the wildest imaginations of romance writers, has there occurred a suicide to compare with this. Um, and uh, it was a very tragic affair for Ruffin, but he never mentions Thomas Cock really again in any of his writings. Uh, but this is going to be a little bit of uh, foreshadowing of what's going to be coming up in, in just a few minutes. Uh, but Ruffin then is going to have a, a, a pretty, pretty tragic few years. Uh, his wife, uh, Susan, dies in 1846. Um, and, uh, and even though that, he's, he moves to his plantation at Marlborough. This is the house, actually still exists today. Uh, uh, it's still in the family. Um, and uh, this is Marlborough, and this is going to be his main home all the way up throughout the Civil War. Uh, and in fact, during one part of the Civil War, it's actually taken over by Union soldiers, and uh, Sheridan uses this as his headquarters for a little bit. Uh, but that's his home, Marlborough. Um, and then in 1851, uh, Edmund Ruffin, this is the first like major picture of him that goes out to the public, uh, and it's published in this magazine, DeBose Beaux Review. And this is where a lot of people get their first look at who Edmund Ruffin is. And this is where Edmund Ruffin starts becoming relatively well known, at least in the South. A lot of people start to know who he was. Um, but Ruffin, at around this time, 1850s, uh, he's going to retire from doing any sort of agriculture work, uh, and he's going to be focusing more and more on the sectional crisis that's breaking out. Uh, Ruffin, uh, during this time period, throughout the 19th century really, is, uh, starts more and more viewing the northern states as a huge, uh, uh, something to be feared for by the south. Uh, he views them as, you know, culturally, uh, economically, um, everything to be the enemy of the South. And he views that, that, that you know, he's, he starts becoming a huge proponent of secession. Uh, and this becomes, is really going to become his, his passion uh, for the rest of his life. Uh, and he believes that, you know, Northerners are essentially a different race of people altogether. Uh, and that the best the South could do is to totally uh, secede from the Union uh, to create their own country as the country's expanding and there's all these debates over slavery and uh, the, where, where the power in the United States Congress is going to go. Ruffin becomes an early disciple and an early, you know, uh, somebody out there talking about secession. Um, and him and many of the other people who also talk about this, they start being called fire eaters. Uh, and they were called fire eaters because they would go and give speeches. Ruffin, not so much speeches, but writings, uh, where he would start writing all about the importance and the need for the South to break away from the North and form their own country. 
uh, and uh, and it really starts to get you know uh, like I said Ruffin becomes this becomes his main uh, goal in life uh, and we know this because this is actually a, a shot from his from the unpublished diary uh, that you can see there try to see where uh, oh here it is uh, yeah so the diary like I said this is one page so it's amazing that uh, professor from Mississippi State um, uh, William Scarborough went through and transcribed it and indexed it and everything else. So uh, this book, I don't know if it's it's still in print, but you know I know you can get some copies if you go on Amazon uh, and look for it. But they went through and, and edited it, and he started writing this in 1856, uh, and he, he can, does it all the way through until his death in 1865. Um, and it pretty much is daily life of everything he's doing. Uh, you know what he's reading, what he thinks about things. He's a uh, you know just completely engrossed in the news at the time. Um, he meets, because of his class standing and, and, and you know, who he is, he, he's a, he has access to all sorts of famous people at that time. You know, he goes and hangs out with ex-president John Tyler, uh, spends weeks with him and talks to him about all sorts of topics, whether it's slavery, whether it's the sectional crisis, whether it's uh, the economics at the time, agriculture, all sorts of things. So he's really, really into this. Um, Ruffin was getting very depressed though because he was going around preaching secession and breaking away and most people in Virginia were not for secession uh, and uh, it wasn't until this event uh, that kind of rejuvenated Ruffin's desires. Uh, you know, Ruffin was actually in his diary talking about how he was considering committing suicide uh, because he was so depressed about the state of uh, his life. Uh, you know, of his daughters, three of them died in 1855, uh, so he's suffering some personal tragedies. Uh, you know, like I said, most people weren't giving him the credit for being the guy who rejuvenated the soil there in, in Virginia, so he felt like he was being, being kind of left out. Um, and nobody was listening to his secession plans. Well, then this happens. Uh, John Brown uh, raids Harper's Ferry, and it causes this. And you know, this was the moment where Ruffin said, "Now's our opportunity to strike for um, for secession." Uh, Ruffin is so excited about this that he actually goes up, uh, just joins up with the VMI cadets, puts on a uniform, and marches there so he can be at the uh, hanging of John Brown in December of 1859. Um, and Ruffin you know, writes about John Brown being, you know, it's interesting because John Brown is definitely a radical on the abolitionist side. Ruffin is very much a radical on the secessionist side. Um, and here they were together and, and Ruffin watches John Brown get killed. Uh, he says, the villain who, whose life has thus been forfeited possessed but one virtue, if it should so be called. This is a physical or animal courage or the most complete fearlessness in it, or insensibility to danger and death. In this quality, he seems to me to have few equals. Uh, so on December 2nd, 1859, they hang John Brown. That was up in Charlestown, West Virginia. Uh, and Ruffin is going to use this moment to try and galvanize support for secession. Uh, John Brown was an abolitionist who hoped to use uh, these pikes uh, to arm all the slaves, have them rise up against their masters, uh, and kill them. Uh, Ruffin is going to take these pikes, he's going to grab like 13 of them, and he's going to send them out to all the southern governors of all the south, uh, southern states uh, with a little plaque on it uh, that said, uh, uh, it, it said, you know, this is what our northern brethren have in store for us. Um, but so, and Ruffin's actually going to take a pike, he's going to go around places like Washington, D.C. He's going to stand downtown Washington, D.C. holding a pike trying to tell people about the importance of secession. Uh, Ruffin writes a fictional novel called The Anticipations of the Future, where he you know, writes that you know, he believes a civil war will break out, although he predicts it will happen in 1864. But he does rightly predict that it's going to happen in Fort Sumter, uh, and then, uh, but in his fictional story, the South actually wins, and uh, they form two separate countries. So. Uh, but he writes this out and he passes this out to all sorts of people um, uh, in places of power. But uh, that's what he's doing leading up to Lincoln's election. Uh, there's another image of him. 
Um, but Lincoln is elected president in November of 1860. Uh, Ruffin leaves immediately, goes down to South Carolina, uh, where he's actually invited. Uh, he's actually in the room uh, when South Carolina secedes from the Union. And this was like the moment that Ruffin had been waiting for. Finally, a state had left the Union. Uh, he writes that if Virginia remains in the Union under the do domination of this infamous low vulgar tyranny of black republicanism, and there is one other state in the Union that has bravely thrown off the yoke, I will seek my domicile in that state and abandon Virginia forever. If Virginia will not act as South Carolina, I no longer have a home, and I am a banished man. So here, you know, very different than the majority of Virginians, say for like Robert E. Lee, people who go with whatever the state decides. Ruffin's saying he's for secession in the South, uh, regardless of wherever Virginia stands. And Virginia then began meeting and debating the idea of secession. Uh, and Ruffin was hoping that they would join uh, with the other southern states, but Virginia was not doing anything uh, yet. Uh, they were just merely thinking about it. And that's where the, the, all the drama broke out in Charleston Harbor. So this is a map of Charleston Harbor. Uh, this is the famous Fort Sumter out in the middle of the harbor. This is downtown Charleston. Uh, and you can see the uh, Fort Sumter and Fort Moultrie were meant to defend any enemy ships coming in from, from the ocean. Uh, and uh, what happens is, is there are about, you know, just a, a 100 or about 80 Union soldiers that are stationed here on Fort Sumter. And uh, the new Confederates uh, ring the entire harbor with artillery. And they're trying to get them to leave. And they won't leave. And that leads to this impasse. Uh, and finally, uh, what's going to happen in April of 1861 is Abraham Lincoln sends down ships to reinforce those 80 guys that are there at Fort Sumter. Uh, and that's when the Civil War breaks out. Because what's going to happen is General Beauregard, who's in command of the Confederate troops down here, says, open fire on Fort Sumter if they try to resupply it. Uh, and so they get the command on April 12, 1861, to open fire on Fort Sumter. Uh, and this is a view. Uh, now, back to the map real quick. Uh, Edmund Ruffin goes down to Charleston. He joins up with a military unit. Now, remember, Edmund Ruffin is 67 years old. This is an old guy with the long white hair. It must have been an interesting sight seeing him joining up with uh, the Palmetto Guard. Uh, and he's going to be stationed right down here at Cummings Point uh, on Morris Island. Uh, and that's the view from it. And they're going to say he, has the, uh, he can have the honor of firing the first shot on Fort Sumter. What actually happens is, is on the morning of April 12, 1861, uh, they give Major Robert Anderson, who's commanding the Union troops there at Fort Sumter, they give him the opportunity to leave. Otherwise, they're going to fire on the fort. They go back to James Island. Uh, and uh, they actually give this man, Roger Pryor, another Virginian, the honor of firing the first shot. He says he will not fire the first shot on Fort Sumter. Uh, so this man, Captain George Cook, is going to give the order to fire on Fort Sumter. Uh, and a, a, a lieutenant is going to actually pull the lanyard, and it fires the first shot that goes up over the fort and it explodes. That was the signal for all the other forts to open fire. And as soon as that signal went off, uh, they went at, oh, this is a monument on James Island that commemorates where that shot was fired. Uh, but they open fire on Fort Sumter. Edmund Ruffin is on Cummings Island. He fires the first shot that actually hits the fort. Uh, so when people say he fired the first gun, yes, he fired the first gun. It's the first gun that hit the fort. Uh, but the, the very first gun was a signal gun so that everybody else would know to open fire. So Ruffin's given that honor. He fires the gun. They bombard the fort for 36 hours, and the Union finally surrender. Edmund Ruffin actually carries this flag, uh, which is now in the Fort Sumter collection, carries that onto the island. Uh, they raise it up over the fort. The Confederates take the fort and immediately both sides go to their, rep, uh, you know, their, their own corners. Uh, the North quickly starts raising up troops. As soon as this happens, as soon as the first shots are fired at Fort Sumter, and this is the interior of Fort Sumter. After that, you can see the new First National Confederate flag flying over the fort. As soon as this happens, President Abraham Lincoln calls up 75,000 volunteers to invade South Carolina and subdue the rebellion. Uh, this action of calling up the troops is going to drive the Virginia Secession Convention over the edge. Virginia is going to vote to leave the Union, and Ruffin can't believe it. Uh, Ruffin actually wrote uh, when, when he found out that Virginia finally 
Ruffin had given up all alcohol uh, for most of his life, but he says when he found out that Virginia had seceded, he downed an ale and had a shot of whiskey uh, in celebration. He went down to Charleston and fired off a secession cannon uh, that they would fire to celebrate new states leaving the Union. Uh, on that day, April 17th, 1861, when Virginia secedes, Ruffin gets this picture taken. Uh, this is the probably the most famous photograph of him, and this starts get, this gets passed all around the country. Uh, and uh, it's you know Edmund Ruffin, the guy who fired the first shot. You can see his hat there has a PG for Palmetto Guard, uh, and uh, and he's ready to go back up here to Virginia. He comes back to Virginia after Virginia has seceded, uh, and uh, he wants to be in the action. And that's where we get to Prince William County. Manassas Junction, right down here. Ruffin is at home for maybe like a month, uh, and he starts getting itchy feet. Everybody's joining up with Confederate regiments. They're marching off to war. He wants to be in the midst of it. Uh, so after a little bit, he hops on a train, comes up here to Manassas Junction. At that time, this area of Manassas, yeah, there wasn't any of this old town Manassas at that time. Uh, so he comes here to the junction where the train station is, uh, and Ruffin is looking to just meet up with his old Palmetto Guard uh, buddies who he had just been down in South Carolina with. They had come up with Kershaw's brigade, uh, and they were getting ready to march off to defend Manassas against uh, McDowell's army that was coming here. Uh, so Ruffin uh, uh, comes up here, and it's just interesting when you're reading through his diary, uh, you know, all the different personalities he's meeting. So when he, he stays here in Manassas, the next morning he wants to meet up with the Palmetto, so he gets a, hops in a carriage with Colonel James Lawson. And Kemper, uh, who's going to go on to become a famous general during the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, and Ruffin is writing in his diary all about the importance of uh, using the black flag. He thinks there should be no mercy shown to any invaders of Virginia. And he's also surprised by how much of a celebrity he has become. Uh, like I said, he was kind of at odds with most of his Virginian brethren for most of his life. Uh, while he's driving up here, He's being stopped on the train, being asked to give speeches. Uh, everybody's applauding him, shaking hands with him. When he goes to Richmond, he, you know, he's meeting uh, Vice President Alexander Stevens. Uh, he's meeting all sorts of people, and all of a sudden, he's a welcome figure to them. Uh, this is the first time he felt like uh, people actually uh, were, were respecting him for everything he had been uh, saying for his whole life. Um, in fact, it is an interesting story where he, he's upset that the, the general down uh, in the southeast Virginia who's building a fort wasn't doing it correctly. So he just went and marched over to Robert E. Lee's office and went in and met with him and said, I think he should change the, 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 the officer in charge down there. Of course, Lee said he would look into it and, and uh, uh, pushed uh, Ruffin on his way. Uh, but all of a sudden, Ruffin is now you know, in these inner circles, and he's going to be meeting with all sorts of people at that time. Uh, but yeah, so, so he's, uh, he comes up to Manassas. He goes out to Fairfax Courthouse, where the Palmetto Guard is. He's hanging out there for a couple weeks. Uh, in that time, he's you know, talking with uh, Kershaw, uh, all sorts of other Confederate officers in the camp, trying to get an idea of what's going on. On July 17th, 1861, uh, that's when uh, there, there's first uh, there's going to be some action that's going to happen. Uh, the Union start pressing forward. They retreat from Fairfax Courthouse to Mitchell's Ford on Bull Run, uh, and uh, he's at Mitchell's Ford on July 18th, 1861, uh, when artillery fire is coming in at their location. Uh, he hears the battle that's going on just about a mile away at Blackburn's Ford. So you may be familiar with the Battle of Blackburn's Ford on July 18th, 1861. So Ruffin's not in the middle of that, but there are artillery shells going off around him. In fact, one piece explodes near him, and he takes a piece of the, 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 the shell as a souvenir. Uh, he liked to try and collect as many souvenirs while he's out there. Um, but anyways, uh, th and there's this great map uh, that kind of shows you. This is actually in the diary. Uh, it kind of gives you an idea of you know, where we are. You can see Manassas Junction down here. Uh, of course, we're somewhere in this area. Uh, and you can see Mitchell's Ford and Blackburn's Ford. And Ruffin's guys were right here defending Mitchell's Ford. And they saw a little bit of action, but not much. Most of the battle happened up here by Blackburn's Ford. Uh, but Ruffin uh, is going to hang out for a couple more days, and then he's getting tired. He doesn't think there's going to be another major action. 
So he heads back to Manassas Junction when July 21st happens. Uh, and this is going to be the first battle of Manassas. And Ruffin comes down here to Manassas Junction. He hears about it. He immediately comes up that morning and comes to Lookout Hill, uh, where uh, he's going to be for the morning of July 21st, 1861. Um, and uh, this is interesting because, you know, this map is interesting because it shows you kind of where Ruffin's going to go that day. Um, and I actually overlaid it uh, on, a, on a modern map uh, to kind of get an idea of, of where these places he were. Um, you can see Lookout Hill down here up on the battlefield, just to give you an idea of some of the places we're going to talk about. I'm going to talk about this Cub Run and the Suspension Bridge. Um, but this is Lookout Hill today, uh, Yorkshire Elementary School. Um, you can actually go up there. There's a Civil War Trails marker up there. Uh, and he's up there with about 40 or 50 other people watching the battle. Ruffin has his musket. He's watching it. G Generals Joseph E. Johnson, Beauregard, Bonham are all up there. Uh, and they actually get fired on while they're, they're watching the engagement. Ruffin though, wants to be in the action. He hears all the action happening over by the battlefield. Uh, so he just picks up his musket and starts walking across fields trying to find his way to the battlefield. Uh, and uh, he comes up uh, eventually near the Lewis House uh, on the Rock Road here. Uh, and he comes across a group of about 100 skulkers. Uh, and uh, he said they said that they were wounded, um, but he said later he found out that these were just people who didn't want to be in the battle because he said it was confusing. that They all said they were wounded, but they were all standing, and none of them were sitting or laying down. Uh, and Ruffin says, what's going on? They said, well, we lost the battle. It's a huge defeat. Uh, Ruffin is, you know, he says, well, you know, we should try and rally and go back. He says, who will come with me? Uh, and he said, nobody said anything. Uh, so uh, he just kept on going on his own. He's going up the road, and there are Confederate reinforcements coming up the road. And finally, he sees this artillery company uh, under uh, um, uh, Del uh, Kemper, uh, who was a uh, Alexandria light artillery, who was, uh, you know, connected with the South Carolina regiment he was with. And he just says, uh, he says, hey, can I get a ride? Uh, and they didn't have any room on the caisson, so they said, well, you can hop up on the cannon. Uh, so Ruffin hops up on the cannon, uh, and so he's riding on the cannon uh, up this road, uh, and, you know, holding a musket in one hand and holding the cannon on the other. Uh, he said, you know, it must have been a ludicrous sight to see him, you know, this long 67-year-old man with long white hair hanging onto this cannon riding up the road. Uh, but it was kind of a celebrity, almost like a mascot. They said as they were riding by, people were giving large cheers for him uh, as he rode by. Um, and, uh, and they keep following the, the, the Union Army up that way. Um, and uh, he's not sure what's going to happen. Uh, and then they start getting reports that, no, they are actually winning. And they were driving the Union back. Uh, and then they come to this. This is the Cub Run. So uh, in the late afternoon, as the Union's retreating, uh, and I'll go back just to point it out to you so you can get an idea of this action real quick. Uh, you can see most of the battle is happening over here. Uh, the Union's driven back, and as you can see, the Union originally took this kind of uh, uh, roundabout way coming into the battlefield. So when they retreated, many of them were taking this roundabout way back out. Uh, some of them were going back out this way. And both columns were converging right over the Cub Run where that bridge was. Uh, oh, sorry, right there. Um, and uh, both columns were coming together. And this was kind of like the exit route for a large portion of the Union Army. Uh, and this is what it looked like a few months later. Of course, the bridge had been destroyed, but this is the Cub Run. Uh, and this is actually what it looks like today. You can actually see it there today. But Ruffins, this is a viewpoint from the Union side uh, with them retreating across the Cub Run. Today's is Route 29. Uh, if you, you know, I wonder how many people commute on this, not even realizing what, what, what happened right here. But Ruffins guys come up here. They unlimber their artillery in the road. Uh, and Ruffin is given the honor of firing the first shot uh, again. Uh, so Ruffin gets off of his uh, cannon, uh, he fires a shot, and the shot comes down, the Union are retreating over here, there's a wagon trying to get across, the shell explodes, 
kills some of the horses. The whole wagon overturns uh, and basically blocks the entire bridge so nobody can get across. And a panic breaks out among the Union troops. Everybody breaks out in different directions. They all go splashing across the creek. Uh, and they end up leaving behind all sorts of material, cannons, or, uh, uh, ambulances, all sorts of things. And Kemper's guns keep firing on that spot. But it was Ruffin's first shot. Uh, that kind of did all that. Um, and Ruffin, you know, this was his, essentially his high water mark right there. Uh, he actually says, uh, um, uh, Colonel Kershaw afterwards uh, wrote about this. He said, the venerable Edmund Ruffin, who fired the first gun at Fort Sumter, who as a volunteer in the Palmetto Guard, shared the fatigues and dangers of the retreat from Fairfax Courthouse and gallantly fought through the day at Manassas, fired the first gun at the retreating column of the enemy, which resulted in this extraordinary capture. Uh, and uh, so Ruffin fires that shot. The Union finally panic and run. It was a rout. Uh, and Ruffin, uh, the next day, is going to get on the train, head back uh, to Richmond. And he actually writes that he thinks that the, the war is over. Um, they thought this was the, the end of the war. Of course, that didn't turn out to be the case. Um, this is a view from approximately the location of where Ruffin's uh, would have fired that shot from. And as you can see, it's a clear shot going right down there. And that's where the Cub Run Bridge was. Just took that the other day. so. Uh, Ruffin, uh, before he leaves Manassas, he goes among the, the wounded at Manassas, and uh, he, he writes, you know, just, it's very sad to, you know, he, he sees what it looked like, but a great description of what the battlefield looked like afterwards. Uh, he said that the countenances and postures generally indicated the suffering of agonizing pain. This is the dead bodies he's talking about. Uh, he said, clotted blood in what had been pools were under or, or by almost every corpse. From bullet holes in the head of some, the brains had partly oozed out. The white froth covering the mouths of others was scarcely less shocking in appearance. Uh, but he said what really, you know, saddened him was the wounded. He saw all these wounded soldiers, and Ruffin actually gets down and gives some water to a wounded Union soldier. Uh, and uh, he saw some Confederates kind of gathering around some of the wounded. Uh, they were accosting them, saying, why are you down here invading us when we uh, committed no harm to you? And Ruffin went over and dispersed them and said he should leave. Uh, uh, he said, and he wrote in his diary, he said, no one more bitterly hates the Northerners as a class than I do, or would be more rejoiced to have every invading soldier killed. But my, all my hatred was silenced for the wounded, seen in this long and continued wretched state of suffering. Uh, so even, you know, that, you know, somebody like Edmund Ruffin, whose goal it was to kill every Union soldier, and he actually rides out to the Cub Run Bridge afterwards, uh, and he's looking, he wanted to see how many Union soldiers he killed, and he's sad because he finds only three dead Union soldiers there at the Cub Run Bridge. And he said, there must have been more. Uh, and he, he actually writes that, you know, uh, this was a great disappointment to me. I should have liked not only to have killed the greatest possible number, but also know, if possible, which I had killed and to see and count the bodies. Uh, but then he determined that many of the bodies probably were moved uh, to get ambulances back and forth across. So uh, later he estimates that he killed about eight to 10 Union soldiers there at Cub Run Bridge. Um, but, Ruffin, like I say, he thinks the war is over. Of course, it's not. Um, and Ruffin's going to come back. He goes back to Richmond, uh, and he's going to come back to Prince William County uh, later that year. And this time, he's going to come up on the eastern side uh, to Dumfries. Uh, and Ruffin was not very impressed with Dumfries. He comes up here in October of 1861 uh, because he wanted to be here on the, on the Potomac River when he sees uh, whatever great battle is going to break out on the fortifications there. Um, and he actually, he writes that he, you know, he takes a carriage up here. Of course, the train didn't come through Dumfries. So he takes a carriage up here, uh, and he describes it as a wretchedly decayed little village. Uh, comes up here at night, comes to the inn. Of course, he describes exactly what it looks like inside the hotel, uh, where all these different soldiers are staying there. Um, and he's looking for lodging. He finally does get somebody. To, to let him uh, get, get a bed in a nearby house. He stays in Dumfries. The next day, he goes out to go inspect uh, the fortifications along the Potomac. Uh, and here you can see uh, Freestone Point and Cockpit Point. But he goes down here to Evans Point. 
uh, where he wanted to inspect the batteries down there. Uh, nothing's left of them today, but he goes down there and uh, uh, meets with uh, Colonel Wigfall, uh, who is in command of the troops down there. He inspects the batteries. He's hoping that there's going to be some sort of engagement here. It doesn't happen, uh, and so he leaves, goes back to Dumfries, and then he wrote, uh, I could not be worse off anywhere for amusement than in this miserable, decayed village. Uh, the mail comes but twice a week, uh, and the one which will come tomorrow will bring no later news than I read in Richmond the morning before my departure. Uh, so he decides he's had enough of Prince William County, so he leaves. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Ruffin's going to go back down to Richmond. Uh, and then for the rest of the war, basically, uh, you know, this is from his diary. I mean, just some of the drawings he did, which is kind of interesting. This is a Fort Sumter. He, go, he travels down to South Carolina. Is Again, you know, he gets these passes to meet with all the generals uh, and all the colonels and uh, meets with them. He, he draws all these drawings. And he's basically hanging out uh, uh, throughout Virginia, basically running from, from Union soldiers for most of the rest of the war. Um, and uh, meanwhile, his, you know, his, his family life is going to take more hits. Uh, this is his son, Julian, uh, who's actually killed uh, at the Battle of Drury's Bluff in May of 1864. Uh, and this was a real hit to Edmund Ruffin. Um, and more and more, he starts seeing that the, the Confederate cause is essentially get lost. Uh, and this is quite depressing to him. Uh, and you know, he actually wrote uh, that if he had his way, uh, artillery shell at Cub Run Bridge would have exploded and killed him up there. That was his highest point. Um, but you know, as, as Union armies came in, like I said, they, they, they graffiti and, and damage his beechwood plantation. They take over his Marlboro plantation. Uh, he's forced out to Amelia County, where he kind of is watching the war. Uh, and he's writing about all the news he's learning of Lee's army around Richmond and Petersburg, of course, the, the death of his son. Um, and uh, at this point, by early 1865, he's already contemplating the suicide at that point. Uh, he writes that I can no longer be of any use either to myself, my family, or my country. Uh, my part in the drama of life, whether well or ill, has been played out and is finished. Uh, he wrote that in January of 1865. Um, by April, uh, he hears the cannon fire from the Battle of Sailor's Creek. Uh, he learns about General Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. Uh, and at that point, Ruffin decides that he will commit suicide rather than live, as he would say, under the rule of, Yankee, of Yankees. Um, he starts going through the Bible. And he, he, he writes about this so analytically in his diary. He writes about how he goes through the Bible looking for justification for suicide, saying that he doesn't find anything in the Bible that actually uh, condemns suicide other than uh, thou shalt not kill, which he thinks that in his, in his idea, uh, he's more of a burden to his family and everybody else uh, than anything else. Uh, so anyways, he makes his, his idea. So on June 17th, 1865, uh, Ruffin determines he will commit suicide. Uh, he has breakfast with his children uh, at Redmore. Uh, you know, he uh, writes in his diary uh, his last words. Uh, he wrote, I here declare my unmitigated hatred to Yankee rule, to all political, social, and business connection with the Yankees and to the Yankee race. Would that I could impress these sentiments in their full force on every living Southerner and bequeath them to everyone yet to be born. May such sentiments be held universally in the outraged, downtrodden South, though in silence and stillness until the now far distant day shall arrive for just retribution for Yankee usurpation, oppression, and atrocious outrages, and for deliverance and vengeance for the now ruined, subjugated, and enslaved southern states. Uh, so that was his final words he wanted uh, to be known. Uh, and then all of a sudden they get a knock at the door. They had some visitors for lunch. Uh, so he writes, had some visitors for lunch. And then he writes one last thing. He writes, and now with my latest writing and utterance and with what will be my latest breath, I here repeat and would willingly proclaim my unmitigated hatred to Yankee rule, to all political, social, and business connections with the Yankees and to the perfidious, malignant, and vile Yankee race. Uh, and with that, he places a musket into his mouth, uh, uses a forked stick to push down the trigger, 
uh, and that's when the, the musket goes off, but it misfires. Uh, so the cap goes off, but the actual charge doesn't go off. It alerts the household, so then he moves it back, puts a new cap on, puts his mouth back on the musket, and then he fires it again. This time it was successful. Uh, blows his brains out. Uh, they said, well, the family, when they came in, they said the upper portion of his head was entirely blown off. Uh, blowing off the crown of the venerable old gentleman's head and scattering his brains and snowy hair against the ceiling of the room. Uh, and that was the end of Edmund Ruffin. Uh, and Ruffin, this is the house uh, where he committed suicide, Redmore, which still stands, privately owned, private residence today. Uh, but I actually had the opportunity to, to be there uh, uh, and actually the, be in the room where that happened. It's been renovated a lot on the inside, but this is the room. It was right over here where he committed suicide. Uh, and uh, this is, his body was brought back to his home at Marlborough. Uh This is his grave there. Uh, and uh, so you could argue that Edmund Ruffin fired the first and the last shot of the Civil War. Um, but uh, I would also argue that there were three important shots fired by Edmund Ruffin in his life, and that was at Fort Sumter, of course his end there in Amelia uh, County, and then here at the Cub Run Bridge was the other famous shot fired by uh, Edmund Ruffin. Thank you very much. Uh, if uh, anybody has any questions about Ruffin or his time here in Prince William County, I'd be happy to answer it. So, yeah. Uh, is there any particular event that happened to him, like 1850, when he decided to get out of agriculture and to promote this succession? Uh, I wouldn't say it was one particular event. I think it was something that uh, he see, saw throughout his whole life. I mean, it's interesting because, yeah, how, why does he hate Northerners so much? Uh, and he only, I, I found evidence that he probably visited the North uh, only once or twice. Um, and uh, I don't think he was impressed by his visits up there. Uh, but what, where does this, you know, anger and hatred come from? I think it was really... Uh, uh, what he saw as, uh, like I said, um, you know, from the political realm of things, I think that uh, uh, he just saw that the Virginia and the South were going to be losing power within the uh, United States government. So he was looking for any way to maintain the prosperity of the, the state he had so uh, spent so much time on. And like I said, he was very pro-slavery. So, you know, when abolitionists started antagonizing to try and end slavery, he got very defensive about that. Uh, now Ruffin's views on slavery changed during the war too, because he actually th he said he said he didn't think that the slaves would uprise. He didn't think the slaves would run off to the Union side during the Civil War. I think we had uh, Stu Henderson talking today about the United States Colored Troops. That was a total surprise to Edmund Ruffin. Uh, he was totally surprised that they w ran off willingly on, into the North. It's just his you know viewpoint of of the world at that point. Uh, and, uh, and, and after the war, when he started hearing about, you know, what the free men were, you know, were, were charging for labor, he said, you know, actually, you know, we probably could do without slavery. Um, but, uh, but as far as his hatred for, for Northerners and his, uh, you know, conversion to secession, I think it was a, a long thing throughout the 1830s, 40s, and 50s that he became, uh, you know, and like I said, personality-wise, he was just very contrarian. Uh, he was always, you know, anything anybody told him about anything, he would, you know, basically argue with you about it. Um, and he, he was very opinionated about that. So I think uh, that was also just part of his personality. Yeah. Um, when he was going toward the battlefield, he got a riot from Yes. Yeah, they, they were soldiers who had left the, uh, the battle. And like I said, he called them skulkers. Uh, and he wrote, you know, in his diary, he, he like, 
he'd go back and write back in the diary and he wrote later he said he said I've since found out that uh, these were called skulkers and that they were basically saying that they were wounded or that the battle was going bad for them to excuse their cowardice um, and uh, and so yeah so those were that was a group of, uh, of, of men who had fought in the early stages of the battle fell back said the battle was going poorly. And Ruffin, as he continued going, it, it kind of gives you a sense of really what they call the fog of war, that like Ruffin from a private soldier has no idea what's going on all around them. Uh, and these, these skulkers were kept saying, oh, the, the battle's being lost. And Ruffin kept going forward. And he actually thought he was going to get captured at one point, because he said, you know, it probably is going bad. Uh, and the Union had basically a price on his head because he fired the gun down. And it was well reported throughout the North, north that he fired the shot on Fort Sumter. Uh, and, uh, and he said, but it was for shame. He didn't want to have to walk back through those skulkers uh, and say that he was retreating. So he just kept going on. And uh, yeah, it turned out the skulkers were wrong. Uh, and a lot of the people were wrong. And the, the Confederates were victorious there. But uh, yeah, it could have been very different. So uh, yeah. You know, you know, it's such a sad end that, that this man had. Did, did his family have any indication that that he was that was depressed, that he was thinking of, you know, you know, taking his own life? I would have thought they would have tried to. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It, it, it's fascinating because, like I said, his mentor, Thomas Cock, who did almost the exact same thing, Ruffin writes, you know, this long thing about how he felt guilty uh, afterwards. They like, was there something I could have said that would have prevented this? Uh, and uh, as far as his family, they, I think they knew that he was depressed. Uh, his daughter, or his surviving daughters, basically kept trying to get him, you know, they kept saying, because, you know, that he should accept uh, Jesus as his savior, and they kept trying to try and convert him, uh, and, uh, and while he attended church, he wasn't necessarily a, a religious man in the sense that he, he, he believed in the, in the teachings all that well. Um, but no, they said that, you know, his son, who wrote the description of what it was like afterwards, you know, his son said that they had breakfast that morning and he was cheerful and seemed just as uh, normal as could be. And like I said, you read it, he left out complete precise directions where all his belongings were to go. He wanted to be buried just like a Confederate soldier. So nothing just dropped in a hole wearing the clothes he had. Uh, you know, I mean, he, uh, he, you know, he, he timed it so that you know, his son was at home at that time so that he could take his body back to Marlborn to be buried. Like, everything was laid out. He had planned this out for months in advance. Um, but yeah, no, nothing from the, the children seemed to, to, to indicate that it was going to happen that way. Um, but yeah, it is, it's, uh, you know, it's got to be, I, I mean, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's one of those terrible things about uh, uh, to see that happen. And of course, you know, it's the, the family members that are, are left to pick up the pieces. But Ruffin really viewed that he was more a burden on his children than anything else. Uh, because, uh, uh, like I said, they, they were still after him because, you know, he had helped precipitate the whole war, uh, which is interesting because when you look at the fire eaters and the abolitionists, the people who really kind of you know, wanted war. Uh, you know, for four years I worked at the Frederick Douglass House uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, and, and the abolitionists and the, the, the secessionists, they were happy to see the war come about. Most people did not want to see this war came out and they suffered the consequences. But most of the people who saw the war get ignited, they kind of fall back into the recesses while the war breaks out. Ruffin, you know, goes around and tries to be an active participant in it. Um, but, uh, but, but he thought he was a, he thought that they were going to try to do retribution to his family. Uh, and in fact, he says like when his sons go to take the oath or whatever, uh, in Petersburg, they go in, they take the oath, uh, and they say, oh, you're Ruffin. Uh, you, uh, the Edmund Ruffin that fired the first shot on Sumter? And he said, no, that's my, my father or whatever. Uh, so he thought that there was going to be some sort of, you know, specific retribution against his family because of him. Um, so he thought that this would alleviate the burden on his family. And plus, he said he had all sorts of medical issues. I mean, he writes about, you know, all sorts of details of his, you know, his, uh, you know, he was going blind and deaf. And, you know, he was 72 years old at the time. And so he, uh, uh, he figured he was more of a burden on his family than anything else. But yeah, very tragic. Yes. Did any of his grown children become well-known, good or bad, for anything? 
Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think uh, very well known now. I mean, it was interesting. There was a baby born a month after Fort Sumter happened uh, to Julian, the one who was killed and is buried there. That's at, if you saw that gravestone, that's at Blanford Cemetery there in uh, Petersburg, Virginia. Uh, they had a baby, and they named it Edmund Sumter Ruffin. Uh, after you know him firing on Fort Sumter, uh, but as far as you know, famous or notoriety, not that I know of. But like I said, you know, Gene, he he was you know there were a lot of descendants of Edmund Ruffin, and a lot of them, you know, like I said, the family still owns some of the properties associated with him, um, and like I said, just. Anecdotally, I've met many people who have claimed to be descendants of Edmund Ruffin, which is interesting. Yeah. Is there any more to like a reaction from him joining the VMI troops uh, to the fact that the Brown execution? Yep, a bunch of like 16 year olds. Yeah, exactly. You have a 67 year old. No, he writes. I mean, I, I don't know about other people witnessing it, but he writes about what a what a interesting sight it must have been. You know, this old man with all these young boys. Um, but I mean, that's an interesting story also, and in just the, all the personages that are there because. You know, uh, you know, obviously Edmund Ruffin's there, but John Wilkes Booth also happens to be there. Uh, and you have all these other kinds of Stonewall Jackson, uh, Robert E. Lee, you kind of have like this gathering of all sorts of people that witness that one event. Uh, even though, yeah, it was just supposed to be just the military, but Ruffin, like I said, and, and like I said, he has, you know, like I said, he joined up with the Palmetto Guard, you know, and he's like with them camping out, and he's talking about how much terrible it is, like sleeping on the ground and stuff. And then he just goes to the, you know, the, the captain uh, and says, like, hey, I want to take leave and go back. And he's, sure. So he, he, he comes back and forth into the ranks and out of the ranks. Um, you know, on the ride to Cub Run Bridge, he writes that uh, Wade Hampton and his cavalry ride by. And they all give three cheers to Edmund Ruffin, uh, which is, you know, it's just, like I say, it's a fascinating story of this old man who's kind of, you know, I'd say it's kind of like the Forrest Gump of the Civil War popping up at all the, the major events. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. The drawing from Harper's Ferry. Yes, yeah. No, 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 he didn't draw that one. I think that that was a, I, I forget who, I think it's in Library of Congress collections, but yeah. Um, there, there, there were other people there from newspapers okay. that, that covered that. He was, yeah, yeah. He served in the Virginia militia. He didn't see any action, but he served for a couple months in the Virginia militia during the War of 1812. But he wasn't in any battles or anything like that. Uh, no, he was not in the Mexican War. Um, I mean, there's so much more uh, to read about him. Uh, if you're interested in reading more about him, uh, there is a, a good single volume biography, but it's, I think it's out of print, um, but it's uh, by Betty Mitchell uh, called Edmund Ruffin. It's a good like overview of his life, and it's kind of interesting. Like I said, you know, you could go down the, the, the wormhole kind of exploring all different aspects. And it's because, it's because he wrote everything down. Uh, and it's so rare, you know, I, I just imagine him also like doing the Cub Run Bridge and then going back to his tent and staying up till midnight writing all this stuff down. I mean, the, the, the amount of writing he did gives us a real glimpse of not only where he was and what he did, but his views on things, how he thought about things. Uh, it's just... It's really fascinating, uh, and there's plenty of the writings you can explore as well. When did he start, start writing the diary? 1856. Uh, so 1856 to 1865, and the Library of Congress has the original diary. Um, uh, and like I said, but you know, thanks to William Scarborough, it's 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 been tra uh, transcribed and indexed and everything. And it's just a great if you want to kind of get into the mind of a fire eater, uh, which can sometimes be a scary place to be, but uh, interesting nonetheless. So, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate you guys staying around for this talk. Thank you very much.